Welcome to Gospel of Deliverance. I'm Pastor Steve Williams. Thank you for joining me today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts to hear His Word. Father, we thank You for today. We give You honor and glory for Your precious Word. It is our life. It is the means of our life, the instruction of our lives. Every facet of every breath that we breathe is because of Your Word, because of how Your Word directs us to live. Without your word, we are as good as dead, because it is your word that brings faith. We thank you for that faith today, that we truly may lay hold of the promises that you have given to us. We give you all honor and glory. We ask you that you anoint us today, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. From canker worm to favor. Canker worm to favor. How many times do we as God's people feel as though what was precious to us has been stolen or literally eaten up by the enemy? How often when we have thought Hall was going about as well as it could then suddenly we find ourselves in the midst of calamity with trouble all around. Christian, never fear what consumption comes our way. For God will soon turn our darkness into day and He will restore to us what has been taken away. Let's read in Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 27. Again, that is the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 23 through 27. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that had dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Praise the Lord. From canker worm, friends, to favor. Quoting Matthew Henry on verse 25, he had this to say, See how ready God is to succor and relieve His people? How He waits to be gracious as soon as ever they humble themselves under His hand and pray and seek His face. He immediately meets them with his favors. They prayed that God would spare them, and see here with what good words and comfortable words he answered them. For God's promises are real answers to the prayers of faith, because with him saying and doing are not two things. In our modern terminology, we might say two different things. God says something, and he does something. He doesn't say one thing and do another, and do one thing and say another. He says what he means, and he does it. And friends, I tell you of a truth. This truth is directly from the Lord that when we have left behind, we shall gain anew. What has been lost, Yeshua shall restore. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're going to have persecution. That's going to come but God will rebuild for us. What has been given to him, he shall return, and then, on top of that, eternal life will be ours. Mark chapter 10, verses 29 through 30. Mark 10, 29 through 30. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses, 
and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Listen to those promises that we have. I mean, these are deep promises. We're going to receive a hundredfold. Now, that does not mean that you're going to have 100 houses, uh, nor obviously 100 wives or 100 brethren and sisters. What it means that in the Lord, your family of God expands. And what is available to you expands beyond your property. The church becomes your home. Your ministry becomes your home. And then above all of that, eternal life to come. John Gill wrote about this. He said, they will be doubly recompensed once in this life and again in the other world. Hallelujah. Friends, we have something to look forward to. You don't have to be worried that things have happened and that things have been taken or eaten up by the canker worm because God is on hand and he will bring to us again what has been lost, what has been taken away, what has been stolen. Jesus will give again. Ours must be a life filled with fidelity to Christ because of all of these promises. We must be unwilling to forsake him or his ways for even a moment. No one or no thing is worth the splendiferous presence given to us by our Savior and Messiah, Yeshua. And what I find remarkable is that often what we find is that we will lose something or something will be taken away something will be what we think is stolen. And when God replaces, He does it better. Look at old Job. He lost his wife, his children, his lands, his cattle. He lost all of his money. And God returned it to him. Friends, we can rest assured that God is going to do it for us. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. And verse 7, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. John Wesley explains this verse as saying, My love to thee cannot be taken off, either by terrors and afflictions, which, Wesley said, are commonly signified in Scripture by waters and floods, or by temptations and allurements. Therefore, give me thyself, without whom and in comparison of whom I despise all other persons and things. I prefer Jesus Christ above all. I prefer him above my family. I prefer him above my mother and father, my brother and my sister. Yes, even above my wife. Wife, you must prefer Jesus even above your husband. Mother and father, you must prefer Christ above your children. You must cater to Christ and not your kids. For if we put Jesus first, if we put him first, we will gain heaven. See, putting people first will not gain heaven. But putting Jesus first gains you heaven, and gains his temporal blessings and his eternal blessings. Glory to God. Precious people of the Lord, I'm telling you what. We need to know this. The Lord is our God. This powerful creator of the universe. The king of the universe is our God. And when we have felt like the outcast with wounds aplenty. Know this, Jehovah Rapha shall heal us, his people. What has been torn down, he restores. What appears non-refurbishable, that which cannot be rebuilt upon its site, God raises up again. 
We feel like the situation is hopeless, but God raises it up. I am sure that the Jews felt like that there was no hope for Jerusalem to rise again out of the dust, that the tabernacle could not truly be restored. But God raises it up, friends. Jeremiah 30 and verse 17. Jeremiah 30 and 17. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Friends, oh, brothers and sisters, we've got something to rejoice about. Because when the rest of society believes that everything we have is torn down, and their, incur their incursions into the church have sliced it and diced it and chopped it and hacked it and brought in all manner of worldly doctrines, those that will stand strong with Christ will find that they stand on solid ground. Joseph Exel said of this verse, how wonderful in the text is the tenderness with which God speaks. What marvelous considerateness for natural human feelings, for the peculiarities, if I may so speak, of human feelings, Exel continued, when in promising to renew and restore, he speaks not only of restoration, but of restoration on the very spot. Restoration with the least possible loss, the least possible wrench to natural feeling. Restoration of the city on the ruinous heap, on the old foundation, not merely life again, but life where they had lived of old. The hearth to be raised where the hearth had burned of old. The home where home had been. Not one joy or sorrow of association being lost. No change of place. No severance of old ties and thoughts. But all the round of life to begin again on the very site where the days had gone round before. Great mercy would it have been if the decayed city with its palaces and homes had been rebuilt at all and on other spots and other places not known or loved before. But as there would have been a certain sorrow in changing the place of habitation, in making a new home, and on looking back on the bare desert plots where the city had once stood, so God, promising restoration, so promises it, that there should not be one cloud upon the heart in seeing the walls again built, not one touch of sorrow and regret to mingle with the joy. Hallelujah. So said Joseph Exel. Friends, God rebuilds and He rebuilds perfectly. His plans are immaculate. They're marvelous above our thinking. And we think that things have been torn down by the world. They've been destroyed by Satan. It's a lie. I tell you of a truth today, friends. Satan cannot destroy what God has erected. For God simply builds it immediately back better than before. What people have done damage to, God restores. God builds up again, and it's better. And yet, we have all of that wonderful memory. We have all of that memory of home that God has fashioned for us. Hallelujah. From canker worm to favor, that's what we have. All things may seem chewed up, but friends, God takes care of His people. But many of us, if not all believers, we've all felt the rod of correction. You know you have. I'm sure that you could testify today of those times. We have felt His rod of correction upon our backs, administered by His mighty hand, when we've heard, or we've maybe played the rebel. But take heart. For whom God castigates, He loves, and that means you and me, 
We are the beloved of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, we hear specifically about this. Revelation 3, 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Joseph Benson said, Do not imagine that what may seem severe in this address proceeds from any unkindness to thee. Far from it. Love, that is, a regard to thy immortal interests dictates the whole. Oh, how much has his unwearied love to do. Thank you, Jesus. It isn't hard on us. God has no unkindness toward his children. He has their eternal promise in mind. He has their internal life. This eternal life is on his heart all the time. Oh, good friend of the Lord. How quickly sometimes we forget what we have with our Jesus. Sometimes how soon we are apt to forfeit the knowledge of his never-ending gifts for the worries that are at hand. How quickly we forsake faith and solace for those trials that have come upon us. Believer, believe this. Our God is an awesome God, a powerful God, a righteous Savior, full of love, justice, and compassion. We have an awesome God that we are serving. And He is constantly lifting us up and what we go through, the persecution that we go through, the hurts that we go through, He is there to build and to heal. Never fear. God is near. Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 20, verse 22. The Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 22. 16 and 22 in the Gospel of John. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. No man taketh from you. Glory to the Lord. Alexander McLaren had this to say regarding this verse. He wrote, Let me remind you how this very same principle, which applies directly and historically to the resurrection of our Lord, may be legitimately expanded so as to cover the whole ground of devout men's sorrows and calamities. Sorrow is the first stage of which the second and completed stage is transformation into joy. Every thundercloud has a rainbow lying in its depths when the sun smites upon it. Our purest and noblest joys are transformed sorrows, the sorrow of contrite hearts, becomes the gladness of pardoned children. The sorrow of bereaved, empty hearts may become the gladness of hearts filled with God, and every grief that stoops upon our path may be and will be if we keep near that dear Lord, changed into its own opposite, and become the source of blessedness, else unattainable. Every stroke of the bright, sharp plowshare that goes through the fallow ground and every dark winter's day of pulverizing frost and lashing tempest and howling wind are represented in the broad acres waving with the golden grain. All your griefs and mine, brother, if we carry them to the Master, will flash up into gladness and be turned into joy. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! What wonderful commentary upon this Word of God that promises so much. We're not alone. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, it's not just about the resurrection, but it literally affects every section of our lives every single day. So see what confidence is available to us confidence, what support and comfort is ours 
as the children of the Lord Most High. What love has the Father bestowed upon us? Glory to God. Hallelujah. What love. What manner of love. What manner of love has He given to us, friends? Love that supports us and comforts us. Yes, He chastises us as a good and faithful and loving Father. But He's supporting us all along the way. Bringing comfort to our hearts in the midst of loss and persecution. He has bestowed all of this and so much more upon us. I say it is more than we can know and understand while we live here upon this earth. Yet, we need to live within these mar remarkable gifts. We need to spend time cherishing and worshiping God for these marvelous gifts that He has so freely given. All by His grace and His mercy and His love before you and I were even born again. He loved us with a precious love. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. Now our Lord, Jesus Christ Himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Good hope through grace. Everlasting consolation. Nothing to fear. No worries about the canker worm chewing up our harvest. No concerns about our building that we have worked on for the lifetime of our Christianity. No worries about it being torn down and demolished. Friends, God restores. God builds up better than before. Your life may appear to you to be in shambles. God loves shambles. He loves remnants. For He builds nations from rubble, stubble, and remnants. He builds a people, a priesthood. This is who we serve. F.B. Meyer said of this verse, When unreasonable and wicked men try you, turn to the Lord, who is faithful to His promises and to His saints. The stronger the gales of opposition and hatred, the deeper should we become established and rooted in the truth. When it gets hard, in other words. When it gets hard. When it gets tough, the tough get going. True believers take opposition and they stand upon it in faith and they wait upon Christ to build, to strengthen, to restore what the canker worm, and what the enemy has fought against us with and every bit of damage God repairs. The mercy and the multiplied grace of our Heavenly Father is all around us. It is upon us and it is visited in us, filling us daily. Therefore, let us rejoice for this our merciful God. Friends, we need to take time to praise Him. Because it's in that praise as we look at what God has done for us. We look at what He has promised to do for us. To restore what the canker worm has eaten. To give back what has been stolen by the enemy. And what may have been damaged or destroyed. Oh, pastor, maybe you have faced that very same thing of your church being split. Prayer group or Bible study, maybe you had a split because of disagreements, ill feelings. But don't worry. God restores he restores His multiplied grace. It sets us free. Our Heavenly Father is in us. 
around us. Thank God for His visitation. Hallelujah. Thank God for His visitation. Our last verse for today is Psalm 116 and verse 5. Psalm 116 and verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Psalm 116, 5. Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote upon this beautiful verse, The combination of grace and righteousness in the dealings of God with His servants can only be explained by remembering the droning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the cross, we see how gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful, Spurgeon said, or compassionate, tender, pitiful, full of mercy. We who have accepted Him as ours have no doubt as to His mercy. For He would never have been our God if He had not been merciful. See how the attribute of righteousness seems to stand between two guards of love, gracious, righteous, merciful. Hallelujah. Righteousness right in between them, friends. Thank you, Jesus. Spurgeon said, The sword of justice is scabbard in a jeweled sheath of grace. I don't know if any more beautiful words have been written in commentary than that sentence. The sword of justice is scabbard in a jeweled sheath of grace. Yes, God is a just God, but He is merciful. He's gracious. Thank you, Jesus. He's righteous. But it's contained in that grace and in that mercy. And His sword of justice is in that sheath of grace. Praise the Lord. And that mercy extends to us as the canker worm eats. As the enemy combats, don't worry, friend. God has your heart in mind. Don't worry at consumption. Don't worry at destruction. Weary not yourself with how things are going to be done and how God will do it, because, friends, all of us are going to go through difficult times and persecution and at all all times, and all along the way, our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father is there with His grace and His mercy to reach down to us and lift us back up. Maybe you've tripped. Maybe you've stubbed your toe spiritually, so to speak. Maybe you've been in a dry season where you've been going through the motions. Oh, maybe you felt some dissatisfaction. But I'm here to tell you, the God of all mercy and grace is with us today. He's with us. And we look at our crop, at the field of our planting for the Lord, and we see where the canker worm has destroyed. God can do something we cannot do. He can restore what the canker worm has eaten. And we look at the walls of the work of our life and we say, but Lord, how can it be rebuilt? The Sunday school class I was teaching, it seems to be fruitless. The church I've been pastoring, I've lost people. I've lost the enthusiasm in the preaching. They don't seem to want to hear the truth. Don't worry, friend, about the prayer meeting and about the Bible study and how many are there. Because God is the builder and He's the rebuilder. He's the deliverer. He's the restorer. He is Jehovah Rapha. And He heals more than just the body. He heals the mind, He heals the spirit, and He heals what has been torn down. 
He heals what's been destroyed. He heals. And we can rest assured of this. Let us relax. Let us take solace and comfort when we have seen the damage from the world. Let us, instead of being caught up in what's happened, let us be caught up in Him. Let us turn to our Savior. Let us turn to Him. Let us beg of Him His mercy. And we'll never be sorry. Not a moment, not a day, will we be sorry that we have turned solely to Christ. Because He, He restores. He favors us. He gives us His great and mighty favor when the canker worm has eaten up our harvest. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Will you join me in prayer today as we pray for all of those needs? Maybe you have a particular need today. Maybe someone in your family or a friend, someone at church, we're praying for their need today. I don't need to know what it is. You don't even need to know the specifics of it. Friend, all we need to know is that we are to pray. So we're praying for the need. We're praying for their specific request. We bring it before them. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We bring it to the only one of power that can do anything for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for bringing your healing power, Jehovah Rapha, into all of the circumstances. We don't know their names necessarily. We don't know their plight. We do not know all that has went on before. But we do know that you are there to heal. You're there to heal, save, and deliver, and we praise you for it. We give you all honor and glory today for reaching down and touching wherever they may be. It doesn't matter the country. It does not matter how far away from this voice they are. Because as we pray, as we join together as one, you hear our prayers. You say when two or three are gathered together, that you are there in our midst. We praise you for that today. We thank you, Lord God, for touching this very day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for joining me today. And I just hope and pray in Christ that you have a great day in the Lord with your family and your friends on this beautiful day of rest. God bless and goodbye. Thank you.